Hey guys. So appreciate everyone who was able to make it out to the meetup today. Uh, we had a small showing, but I know we had some families traveling. Uh, we had some other uh, events going on. But again, I really appreciate those of you who were able to make it out. Uh, recording a quick recap of the uh, stuff we covered today, just so that, again, for those of you who were traveling or, or doing other things, uh, you don't miss out. Today was very much hands-on based. Uh, it was mostly labs. Uh, so, uh, you know, most of the students were just trying the examples uh, and then I was trying to coach them along as they ran into errors. Okay, so not a ton of new material. Um, and so a lot of it was just getting them set up uh, so that, you know, they could execute the programs. Uh, during the recap, I'll probably go a little bit more, uh, you know, into the material just because, again, you can pause this and, and uh, try out the examples um, at your own kind of pace. Um, and then if you happen to watch this and then you're at the next meetup, we'll cover some of the same material again, uh, and it'll help it sink in a little bit more. Hopefully you'll have a chance then to uh, ask questions. Okay. So let me jump to uh, my screen. There we go. Okay. So again, this is our third iteration of just learning a little bit about Python. We've covered some of the data types up to, up till now, some of the uh, operations that we can do. So now we're trying to pull some of that together uh, by uh, building into uh, our programs a little bit more functionality. Let's do some if checks. Let's build some loops. Let's do things like that, right? Okay. So, oops. Apparently I hit the space bar when I was on the wrong screen. Okay, so again, topics we're going to cover today, what are code blocks uh, and why are they important in our code? Uh, conditionals like if, else, if, or elif. Uh, we talked about some loops, so we got through the for loop. We didn't get through while loops uh, in, in today's meetups, and then we definitely didn't get into functions. That would have uh, been way too much, right? Because again, a lot of it was just set up. Okay, so we start out with a very simple uh, example uh, I emailed out and posted to the Discord a zip file, and inside that zip file, there were multiple uh, folders, and each folder had a main.py, and I named it that way so that it would be easy to use the REPL.IT uh, system. So if I uh, slide uh, my desktop up to REPL.IT, so again, uh, my son logged in just with his Gmail account, automatically put him in, okay? And then once he created a new REPL by clicking the new REPL button when it came up, selecting Python, it had a main.py already up here. I had the I had everyone just click the three dots and delete that main.py. And then uh, apparently I closed my folder. So let me browse uh, projects. Let's see. I've got my STEM club, SCOA, labs. Uh, Python intro. Okay, so these were our files that we were using, and so this simple calculation, if we opened it up, it had a main.py in it. Uh, now I'll probably push the answers out uh, later on, so that makes it a little bit easier for you to follow along. But essentially, you grabbed the main.py, dropped it under files, and then when you click on it, it should load it up here in our window. Okay, so. The first part was just to fill in wherever you see a comment and our comments start with these pound symbols, okay? And so we needed to calculate the total price. Luckily, I gave you the formula up there so we can copy that and we can paste it right there. So now our total price takes the price, multiplies it times one plus the tax rate, right? So I, again, provided that formula to you. So it was just an easy copy and paste. Now we need to calculate the amount of change that's due. Well, we already know how much money we have. So we just type in money. Money minus our total price. If I could type total price. Okay. And then I already have a print statement here for you that essentially just does uh, two decimal points. Uh, and it ensures this is a uh, it prints it as a floating point number, right? So if I hit the run, it executes this from top to bottom, and we see the change due is $7.25, okay? 
So that was the first example, just to get us kind of moving, make sure that you can execute within the REPL.IT uh, you know, web, uh, web page, um, and that you're able to kind of pull back some of that Python knowledge uh, that we had in previous meetups, okay? Now, code blocks. So what are code blocks? So there are times in our code where we need to essentially uh, build sections into our code, or we call them blocks, right? So we need a way to designate that this portion of code is maybe nested under something else, right? So in our example, see here, bring up my pen. If I move that out of the way, uh, I will find that this is C. This is not Python, but I just kind of wanted to show you how some of the other languages do it. So in C, we have this thing, you know, this curly bracket right here. So we have the open curly bracket and we have a closing curly bracket. And that means all of this is inside this main function, right? So again, we have this main function, open curly bracket, everything inside is inside the main function and then curly bracket closes it off. And then additionally, we have a for loop here. So this is the way that uh, C does a for loop. And we see that again, there's this opening bracket and this closing bracket, meaning everything in between it is a part of this for loop, right? So in this case, it's just a single line of this print statement, right? So this printf, right? Now, there is some indentation going on right here. There's some indentation going on right here. And this is really for the programmer, right? This is so that when I look at the code, I can clearly see, even if the brackets weren't here, that this is underneath the for loop, right? So this print statement is underneath this for loop, right? And all of this is underneath this main function, right? So again, the indentation is just for the programmer to kind of visually see, you know, how things are blocked, you know, that all of this is underneath this. All of this is underneath this, right? But notice this one has a single indentation. So we know it's a part of this main, but it's not indented twice out here. So we know this return is not a part of this for loop, right? Again, this is just in the C programming language, it's all visual in this indentation. And I say that because it's actually not required. I could push all of this all the way to the left and the C programming language would be perfectly fine because all it's looking for is this open bracket and close bracket, open bracket and close bracket. That's what it's looking for to determine what is a code block, what sections of code get nested underneath other sections of code, right? So that's how C handles it, right? Python is different. Python, uh, because I didn't have to do this bit of uh, indentation, Again, I could cram everything to the left and the language would be fine. It would just make it ugly. Well, Python tries to, to enforce uh, a little bit of knowing what code is nested underneath other pieces of code and forcing the programmer to write in a way that makes it visually appealing, right? So we don't have opening brackets. We don't have closing brackets. But what we do have is this colon, right? And it's now a requirement to have indentation. And typically for a Python program, that's four spaces. Now, some people get weirded out. There's like Python, you know, enforcing white space, you know, uh, on me that, uh, you know, that's just dumb, right? Well, they did it because it, may, it, it forces you as a programmer to write in a way that makes it easier for other people to read your code, essentially, right? So again, there is indentation here of four spaces, four white spaces, right? And it doesn't have to be four, it could be two, um, but typically it's four. Now, 
you're probably thinking to yourself, does that mean for every one of these lines I have to have have to hit the space key four times? Probably not, right? Most of your editors will automatically indent by four lines or four spaces, and you don't even have to think about it, right? Uh, a lot of your editors, when you hit the tab key, will automatically replace the tab with four spaces when you're writing Python code, right? So a lot of that is just taken you know, away from you. Now, if you're using a traditional text editor where you're, it doesn't have any of that kind of smarts built in, yeah, you might have to hit space a couple of times, right? most people are writing in something that will take care of that form. Even uh, for those of you who are a little bit older, we have this thing called Vim that is a command line editor. Even Vim can figure out that, you know, okay, I'm, you, you hit tab, I'm going to replace it with spaces. You, you know, uh, you use the colon, I'm going to indent. Like, it's even smart enough to do it, and it's a pretty basic text editor, right? Anyway, all of that is to say is that as we write our programs, we'll see this done multiple times where we end a line with this colon, which tells Python that the things that follow, if they're indented, are a part of this group. And so again, we have some indentation going on. And so this print statement is inside this for loop. And so we'll find here in a bit that our for loop basically uh, loops over all of the elements within what we call an iterable, some type of object that has multiple elements. Each one of those elements gets passed across one at a time. And all of the lines then follow this for loop that are indented, it knows is a part of this code block. And it will run each one of those one at a time. Uh, and then once it reaches a point where you've stopped indenting, it will loop back to the top and begin running it again for the next element, all right? So again, none of these brackets, it's just a colon and some indentation denotes that you know we're in a, a code block, all right? So let me turn this off and we'll go to our next page. So a conditional, right? So we need some way to evaluate things in our code, right? And so we've already seen the use of greater than, equal to, you know, a lot of things like that, right? Well, our if statement will help us evaluate those things, right? So the if is going to look for some kind of condition to be to the right of it, and it needs to evaluate to true or false. So in our case, we have speed greater than or equal to 88. So we have some variable called speed, and we're gonna check to see if it's greater than or equal to 88. If it is, notice the colon, all right? So notice this colon here. So if this evaluates to true, I'm gonna go down and start executing the lines that are indented directly below me, right? So this line is indented. So if this is true, I'm going to go ahead and print. You can travel through time. If this is not true, let's say my speed was 65. This is now false. And so the if statement is going to go down to the next un or the next block that's not indented, right? So it's in line with it. And it's going to see if it needs to do another check. So in this case, this is an L if, meaning it's the combination of else and another if statement. And so L if, else if speed is greater than 65, so then we said it, or greater than 55, we said it was 65 earlier. So now this evaluates as true, which means it's going to look for the next indented block, and it's going to print, I see a speeding ticket in your future. Now let's say we were only going 50. So the first time through, if 50 is greater than or equal to 88, this is false. So it goes down to the next one. L if speed is greater than 55, this is also false. So it goes down to the next one and it hits an else. Now else doesn't check to see if, you know, some other condition, it just automatically begins running what's nested beneath it. So again, we have indentation here. So this print statement is nested underneath our, bar, 
underneath of our else. And so it, it prints print Sunday driver, right? So Sunday driver should be output. All right. Now, if this evaluated is true and it prints this line, it's going to print whatever's indented and then it's going to jump out of this entire block, right? So uh, this is the only print statement that's underneath of here. So it's going to jump out and begin executing whatever lines are below, right? Oops. If this is false, it comes down here, evaluates this. If it's true, it executes this line and then jumps out of here and begins executing the next couple lines, right? If neither one of these are true, so they've both evaluated as false, because else doesn't really check for anything, it automatically executes this group or this code block. And then once this code block is done, it begins executing the lines below it. Okay. And I mentioned that because in one of our next examples that may, you know, come up. Okay. So again, these are just conditionals. We're going to check one. If it's true, we'll execute it, but we don't execute the things you know, directly below it, we automatically jump out, right? So the first one that is evaluated as true, it executes, right? So I could nest as many one of these elifs as I want. It's just going to continue going one by one until one of them evaluates as true. And then it's going to jump out of the block, right? So now we jump into our if else hands-on lab. So if I go back to my window, I'm going to go ahead and delete. And you could create a new REPL. Oops, you could create a new REPL. I've just decided to keep the same REPL open and I'll just drag files into it. Okay. So here, instead of our speed that we're evaluating, we're now evaluating our age. So if age is 18 or over, indicate they can vote and drive. If age is 16 or over, evaluate, uh, they can drive but not vote. If age is less than 16, indicate they can neither drive nor vote, right? Now, the layout of this, I, I put the comments in here in this order specifically because if I were, I could evaluate if you're uh, less than 16 uh, and then if you're, uh, less than 18, and then if you're over 18, right? The order matters, you know, how I look at this. If I were to try to evaluate this first, oh, if you're 16 or over, indicate they can drive but not vote. But then I tried to do a check for if they were over 18. Well, this already matched this true. So I'm going to execute the things that are underneath of it. Once I'm done doing those things, I jump out of the block. And so this would never get evaluated if it was, you know, an, uh, an elif that was below this, right? So the order that you evaluate these in, you know, matters, right? So in this case, I'm just saying, hey, if you're over 18 or over, go ahead and vote. So if age is greater than or equal to 18, colon, notice when I hit enter, the REPL here that's on REPL.IT automatically knows this is a nested block underneath of my if statement and it automatically indented, right? And then I can just print, uh, let's say you can uh, both vote and drive, right? Now, in this next bit, if I were to start it with an if statement, it would see these as two totally different conditionals, right? So it's first gonna do this check, and then it looks as this as it was going to be a totally different check and it would execute this as well. So if age is greater than uh, or equal to 16, print, you can drive, All right? So if I did it this way, and let's say my age was 19 instead of 17, and I run it, notice that it 
prints out both you can vote and drive and it prints out you can drive because it evaluated these as two totally separate things, right? So it did this evaluation, this was true, so it printed this. It does looks at this, checks this evaluation, oh, you're true, so it prints that as well. Now, that's not the functionality we wanted. What we really wanted was an ELIF. So now it knows that this is an else if, meaning it's based on something that came before it as well, right? So these are now tied together. So if age is greater than eight equal to 18, this is true. It will print this because I've already matched one I'm going to jump out of the block and I won't even make the second evaluation. So if I hit run, it only prints this line. There's no reason to evaluate this one because I've already matched the true. Again, I'm just going to go one after the next until I get to one that's true. Okay. And at that point, I'll do what's underneath of that and then jump out of the block. Now, this last bit says anything less than 16. So I could also do L if age is less than 16, print, you can neither drive nor vote, All right? And let's say I made myself uh, 16 on the dot, I can drive. As soon as I go below 16, it does run this, right? But this is based on what I've checked before it, that making this conditional check is kind of pointless because I know if they're if this evaluator is false, I know they're not greater than or equal to 16, meaning they have to be below 16, right? So this is kind of a pointless check. And so instead of doing an L if here, I can just do an else and I'll get the same results, but my program is a little bit more efficient because I, I'm not doing this other conditional check that I didn't need to, right? Okay, so you can neither vote nor drive. If I go up to 16, not 165, I can drive. And if I now go 18 or over, I can both vote and drive, okay? And so that's really what I wanted you to get used to. It's just using the if, elif, else, but also to think through it logically on why am I doing it this way? What is the order that I need to evaluate things in? Does it make sense to evaluate if I'm less than 16, right? So thinking about those things as a programmer helps us build better programs, right? All right, so that was else if. And then we jumped into loops. So we did skip over the third one here, um, which was, if I look, we had a lab three. And so I left this one open uh, to you know those who want to attempt it because we did not cover it during our meetup. But essentially, no new knowledge here, but you may have had to do a little bit of Googling uh, to you know, figure it out. So we've done stuff similar to this in a previous meetup, but determine the uh, average grade. So we know that there are ways of figuring out how many elements are in here. We could take the len of this, and then we can also add up each of these elements. You know, So we found in one of our previous meetups that we can do a sum of our grades, and this will add up each of the grades in there. And then I can divide that by the length of our grades. And so that now calculates average. So the average should print down here. And our average comes out as 86.17, okay? Determine the median or middle grade if even number of grades uh, average the two middle grades, right? So this one is a little bit more difficult, right? So we have to determine what is the middle to this. So if it's uh, an odd number of elements, one, two, three, four, five, six, so this is an even number of elements. So we don't have an odd, you know, a, a true middle that I can 
you know, grab. So instead, what it actually is, is the average of these two inside ones. But we need a way to determine if I were to add an extra grade here, this still works correctly. So we probably need an if check, right? So if len of our grades, or I could say, yeah, if len grades, this isn't the most efficient way to do it because we're going to have to check the length again. I should have probably stored it. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll say num grades equals len grades. And now I can use that here. So let's erase this. We'll just click run just to make sure our number didn't change. It didn't change. Okay. So now I know I have a, a variable called num grades. So if num grades modulus two, and I'm going to go ahead and wrap this in a bracket so that I know that it first uh, does this evaluation. So what did mod two do? Well, in one of our previous meetups, we found that you can do a mod two, uh, which basically is a remainder you know, type operation. Uh, so it's going to divide our number of grades by two, and then it's going to return to us the remainder. So if it's divisible by two and it returns a zero to us, we know this is an even number, right? So we'll say uh, equals is equal to zero. So now we know that whatever is up here is an even number, which would fall in line with having to average these middle two, right? Now, so how do we grab the middle two? Well, we already have the number of grades. Uh, so what we can do is grades, and in brackets, we're gonna specify an index value, right? So we have num grades, and we're gonna do integer division here and divide it by two, right? And so let's see what that gives us. So we'll do a print. Oops, too many brackets here. All right, so we're gonna print grades and we're specifically looking for number of grades divided by two, right? And I'm doing this double divide here so I know that the result is an integer and not a float. And so let's see what that gives me. Okay, first off, it gives me an error because it's num grades and I put num grades somewhere right there. Num grades. There we go. So it gave me 88, which gives me this guy right there. Okay, so now I need the one directly below it. Uh, so let's see here. I could do this minus one. So if I did that, because these are zero indexed, I'm actually ending up with, let's see. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm dividing by two, I'm getting three. So zero, one, two, three, because we're using index values and everything is zero indexed. So I can also then, if I copy this, I'm gonna say, and I don't like when it puts all the help stuff up for me. So minus one, and now I get 61, which is this one. So 61 and 88, so that's good. That's exactly what I want. Um, I want to make sure that if I only had two numbers in there, that it works correctly. So let us, I'm going to cheat right here and I will say num grades equals two. So even though I have more than that up here, I want to make sure I didn't shoot myself in the foot and I would get 90.5 and 100. So it works correctly if there's only two grades. Now, if there was only one grade, this wouldn't evaluate as true and I would do the next thing. 
So this is this is good. So I'm going to take that out and we'll say instead of printing them take that out and I am going to say uh, middle equals this plus let's see if it'll let me do that invalid syntax because it doesn't like let's see if it'll let me line wrap it lets me line wrap and ordinarily I wouldn't do this because I'm only doing this because it's easier for you to see on the screen, but essentially that slash is the same as that. It just allowed me to, to line wrap. Okay. Okay. So my middle is correct or should be. And I want to take my median median equals middle divided by If I run this, it's 74.5. So let's see, that should be 61 plus 88. If I bring up my calculator here, 61 plus 88 divided by two, 74.5. So I'm calling that good enough, all right? So that's if it's an even number of values. else let's make sure we hit that back so else meaning if it's an odd number then we're just going to choose the middle value right and so let's say this was 99 wasn't here so it would be uh one two three four five meaning one two three so it should come back with 61 if it's an odd number so Let's try that. And we'll say, again, we're gonna cheat here and we'll say num grades equals, um, we had six before, so now we'll have five. And I have broke something. What have I done? Invalid syntax, lowest equals zero. Oh, I know what I did. I'm missing a bracket right here. So my copy and paste thing, I forgot to get this last bracket. And so the REPL was confused and it didn't know what to do. And eventually figured out, hey, there's an error in my syntax. So it does output 61. Okay, and that was this middle one here. What happens if I only had one? Does that still work? It says 90.5, which it still works. So that's good. And the only time it probably wouldn't work is if I was at zero and then it should blow up in some way, shape or form. So uh, let us, I could make a check at the beginning now, if, if num grades equals zero, meaning there are no grades, median equals zero. We'll just do that. And so it outputs correctly. If there's one, it grabs the very first one as the median. So that's good. If there's two, it averages 90.5 and 100, 95.25 looks about close enough, right? But if I take this out, so it's actually using the correct numbers, we should be good, right? Now, again, this was much harder than, you know, you probably had to be, um, but hopefully with a little bit of Googling, uh, some thought and maybe watching this video, uh, you can kind of understand what's going on. This one was super easy, the median, not so much, right?
Okay, determine the lowest grade. Well, this is pretty easy. There's a function called min, and I just have to give it my grades. And just along with that, the highest grade, there's a max. Okay, so Python makes that one pretty easy. If I run that, I'll see the lowest grade is 61 and the highest grade is 100. Okay, so not too terrible. This one, arguably, I probably made more difficult than it needed to be. Um, but again, sometimes you have to think about what data am I going to have coming in? Is there a chance I have no grades? Is there a chance I have an odd number of grades or, or an even number of grades, right? So this, one, again, just forces you to start really thinking about the problem you're trying to solve. Okay. Now, loops. So there are two primary looping methods uh, that we use. There's a for loop and there's the while loop, right? So in uh, the example I gave uh, in the class was you have a game and a game is going to have some type of game loop, meaning that what are the things that it's it's going to do over and over again? Maybe it has to update my position. It has to update the position of the people around me. It has to calculate, did anybody die because we're fighting? Meaning I need to, you know, drop that person's loot and they get exited from the game. You know, lots of different things. But essentially, it's going to do those things over and over again. Once it's done everything it needs to do, it starts over. I'm going to calculate my position, the position of the people around me. Has anyone died? You know, those sorts of things, right? So there's some repetition in our program that we need to make sure happens. So for loops in Python essentially take something that we call an iterable, meaning that it has multiple elements that we can loop over, right? Uh, and then it's going to give us access to those elements one at a time. Whereas a while loop is more like, hey, there's some condition that is going to indicate to me whether I should continue doing something or not, right? So in the case of like the game loop, maybe I'm going to keep going through this game loop until my hit points reach zero, in which case I've died and I now need to exit out of the game, right? or the user has chosen they want to exit the game. Otherwise, I'm gonna continue updating my position, update the position of people around me, and so on and so forth. So for loop, again, just takes some type of iterable. What is that iterable, right? Maybe it's a list, because a list has multiple elements that we can access, a set, a dictionary, even the letters of a string, right? So if I have the word loop, I can first loop across the L, then the O, then the second O, and then finally the P, right? So the example that we have here is uh, I built uh, a tuple, and what it contains is the word Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, so on and so forth. And so in our for loop, what happens is we take the variable day of week, and it's going to one at a time take those elements and place them in day. And then notice we have the same kind of structure here where we have the colon and then we have indentation. And then I'm going to print day. So the first time through this loop, Sunday comes across and I print Sunday. The second time through the loop, I go Monday and I print Monday. And so we see this output essentially loops Monday or Sunday, Monday. Tuesday, Wednesday, so on. Once I get to the very end of my loop, it knows there's no more elements to loop over, and so it exits the loop and begins executing code below the loop, right? And so again, it depends on the type of object we give it. In this case, I gave it a tuple, and this tuple contains strings, and those strings, you know, I take one of them at a time. Now, if this was a string itself. So instead of days of the week being a tuple, it was just a word. It would take, you know, uh, the individual characters. So maybe in the case where I had um, the word loop before, the first time through loop, I would print L and then I would print O and then I would print O and finally I would print P, right? So it depends what you're giving it, but essentially I need some type of iterable that I'm just going to continue to loop over, okay? So now we jump into our for loop example. So I'll slide up 
I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this example. I'm going to go ahead and, oops, go back to my folder, for loop, and main. Okay? And so the first thing it's asking me to do is join and print the fragment. So this isn't really a for loop portion, but makes you think about maybe what you're doing. So how do I join things in Python? Uh, well, it happens to be that each of these elements in this list are strings. So we could Google, how do I join strings in Python? And you might find that there's this uh, thing called join, right? So if I'm back in my REPL, remember how we could use dir to find out what are the different things that I can access? Well, if I'm given a string, and that's shortened as str in Python, there's all of these methods I can use. Let me try to zoom in just a little bit, and I'll find that there is a join method. So what does the join method do? Well, I can do a help on str.join. And I'll find that it takes an iterable and it concatenates any number of strings, right? So the example they give is they have this quote. So it indicates to Python that this thing is a string, right? And I'm joining that with an iterable. Right? And inside this iterable are multiple strings. And so the result I get is the first element joined with this period, the second element joined with a period, and then the final element. Right, So what that might look like then to me is, let me zoom back out. All right. What this might look like to me is I had I'm hoping it'll drag those over. There it goes. So I have all of these elements and I want to join them together. And so I could just do a print. And inside my print, I'm going to have my join and I'm going to give it an iterable. And we'll see what that looks like. So if I hit run, it does join each of those together. And I have supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, which is, you know, a famous saying. If you've uh, ever watched uh, an old movie, um, I'm sure some of you will know where that comes from. But anyway, I could put a comma in here. And notice it now joins each of these with a comma but I like it to be all together. So now it's supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Okay. Now, here's the for loop example. So loop over the fragments, printing each one on a separate line, all right? So that should be pretty easy. So we have our for loop. And so we're gonna put something, uh, some variable name that we want to place these in. So I'll just call it frag in fragments and my colon, right? So I have fragments. One by one, the individual elements are going to be taken and placed in frag. And again, I could name this anything I want. And then I'm going to print frag out. So if I print that, I will get super califragilistic xb allidocious. Okay, and again, I can name this anything I want. This is what I'm going to call that element once I go into my block. And I could just call this element, all right? And run that, and it does the same thing, right? So that's the for loop. It takes some type of iterable, right? In this case, that iterable is my list, but that iterable could also be a string on its own. So let me do something like this. We'll call this for uh, letter in, and we'll just pass it a word. 
my super long word colon and I will print letter all right and if I hit run I will see that it does in fact take each individual letter and print them out one by one right so again it's just going to take some type of iterable that it can break apart and use inside this block right so not too difficult that is the for loop you'll use it quite a bit in python so let me slide down and i wanted to jump into simple dictionary so no real uh requirement to talk about any new material here so if i delete this one sorry and i go to simple dictionary Hopefully I remember what I put in here because we did not uh, check out Simple Dictionary during our meetup. And let's see, item price, I've got flour, eggs, butter, and milk. There's a price, so the name of the item and then the item's price, it looks like. Build a dictionary of purchases where an item is the key and the quantity is the value. So let's say, uh, what am I gonna purchase? Let me say I'm gonna purchase eggs and uh looks like they're probably a dozen so let me say i get two dozen eggs and then i want some milk and i need to put that there milk and i'll say i'm gonna order uh four gallons of milk maybe we're gonna make some homemade uh ice cream and i just need tons and tons and tons of milk i don't know all right so now we need to determine our total price, right? So build a dictionary of purchases where an item is the key and quantity is the value, and then determine a price. Uh, let's see, determine the total cost of the purchases. For item in purchases, so one of the things about a dictionary when you loop across them is just like any iterable, it has to return something to item. By default, it returns the key, right? So the thing that's gonna come out is eggs and milk, not two and four. Now there are other ways to get two and four out, but let's say we're just gonna do it this way, right? So we're, we get eggs and milk, right? Well, I can do a couple things here. So I have my total and I'm gonna add to it a price, right? And so maybe I want to say my total uh, I'm going to add to it the item price and what item, oops, not that bracket. I need the square brackets and my item. So I'm returning from purchases eggs. I'm going to take eggs and place it in item price, which is going to return to me uh, 3.99. Well, I also have to figure out that I also have a quantity down here because I wanted two dozen eggs, right? So I'm gonna multiply that times purchases also with item, right? So if eggs went in here first, so eggs went into item, I'm first gonna look up my egg price, 399. And then I'm gonna look in my purchase, how many of of that item did I get two. So it's gonna take 399 and multiply it times two. And that will get added to my total. Then it's gonna loop again, right? Cause it's gonna go through purchases and it's gonna return one at a time into item. So the first loop, I'm gonna take eggs and calculate that, add that to my total. And then the second time I'm gonna get milk and I'm gonna look up what is the price of milk. Well, milk is 299. How many uh, did I uh, purchase? Well, I wanted four gallons of milk. It will multiply those out, send them to my total. And it looks like, looks like REPL.IT was broken there for a second, but now it's good. So $19.94. So let's test this. And I will say that I'm only 
purchasing eggs and I'm only going to get one dozen, right? And so what we should expect to see is 399s, which I get, right? What if I didn't get eggs? What if I got milk and I only got one gallon? Run. I get 299. What if I get two gallons? Run. I get $5.98. So this is making sense, right? So this is working. So the key gets returned. I use that key to look up its price. And then the number that I have purchased, you know, in this case, two gallons, right? And so I could get flour. And I want to say I'm going to get two bags of flour. And I'm back up to $19.94, okay? So that's this was combining what we learned about in our for loops with instead of a list, I have a, now a dictionary. And then I use that dictionary to, to get keys out of that dictionary. And using those keys, I can look up its price and the quantity that I purchased, okay? So this one was kind of like the median one where it may have looked a little bit you know more difficult but when it got down to it this one was pretty easy right okay so our while loop so our while loop takes some type of condition and it's going to evaluate that condition and once that evaluates as false it's going to stop executing uh the lines that are underneath there so in my case, uh, we're back to the whole speed thing. Uh, I don't know if anybody caught the whole 88 thing. This is, you know, if you go over 88 miles an hour uh, in Back to the Future, you can, you know, go into the future or the past, right? You can time travel. Okay. So I have a car and this car is an object in and of itself. So I made it. Uh, I don't have it on the screen here. Uh, but essentially it has a couple different methods that we can use. Uh, and it has a couple different attributes that we can use. i to move my cursor over here so that it'll draw on this screen. Okay. Now what we see is I make a car and then I check, is my car's speed less than 88? If my car's speed is less than 88, so if this evaluates as true, I'm going to execute these lines because they are nested underneath of the while by indentation, right? Because I have my colon here that says, hey, I'm going to go into a block. These lines are indented, so it's going to execute those lines. It will not execute this until this evaluates as false. Once it evaluates as false, then I go down here and execute this line. Otherwise, I'm going to keep looping through this while loop doing this over and over again. So my car starts out uh, with speed zero. And I know that because in this first print statement, my speed is zero. Well, then I accelerate by 10 miles an hour and it loops back up. It evaluates this. Is my speed less than 88? Yes, it is. It's only 10. So I print my speed, print 10, and then I accelerate by 10. So now I have printed here. I've now added 10. So I now loop back up to here. I evaluate is 10 or nope. Now I'm at 20. Sorry. So is 20 less than 88? Well, this is now true. So I print out. I get my 20 out and it moves on. And so what I see is that I'll just continue doing this. I'll add 10, go up here, check. If it's good, I print it, add 10 more, go back up, make the check. If it's less than 88, print it, accelerate by 10 more. Now, I'll go all the way up to 80. I'll get to here, 80 is true. I print out 80, I accelerate by 10 more. I'm now at 90. So 90, I come up, look, I make the check. Is 90 less than 88? Uh, no, it is not. So this is now false. So this exits out of the loop and comes down here and prints this statement. So I notice 
the, the last thing I print is 80 miles an hour. And that's because 80 was the last one to evaluate as true. It accelerated by 10 more. It's no longer true. So the next time it looks, it's false. It executes great Scott. All right. Well, back to the future for you. Okay. So nothing too difficult there. It's just your con your each loop, you're going to evaluate whether this is true or false. If this is true, execute the things that are uh, inside this block. Otherwise, exit the block. Okay. So I didn't have a while lab for you, uh, but we moved on to functions. And again, I didn't cover this during the meetup. Uh, so this is bonus material for you if you want to learn a little bit about functions uh, before our next meetup. So functions, if we're writing a long program, there might be sections of our code um, that we use multiple times. Uh, for instance, uh, in our example, we wrote a little script that calculated the price of something, right? Well, maybe I end up using that, um, that bit of code in my program multiple times. And, uh, now I have to update it for some reason. Well, I'd have to go into every part of my code that used that uh, calculation and update it there. A better idea would be to take that code and organize it into a function. And now the sections of my code that need to do that, they just call that function. So I only have to write it one time and I would only have to update it in one place. And anytime I wanna use that code, I just call the function, right? So it's gonna, it's good for code reusability. It's good for making my code easier to read because things are grouped better. Um, and then it'll hopefully reduce uh, errors in my code because maybe I remembered to update it here, but I didn't remember to update it there. If it's all in a function, I only have to update it in a single place, right? Now, our functions can take arguments meaning that there are things that I can pass into them uh, and they can make updates to those things or just return some result to me, right? And so let's take a look at a an example. So I have this password generator, right? And it's a terrible generator. I wouldn't suggest using this uh, function, but I have this thing called random password, right? Now, the way that I... Uh, indicate to Python that I'm beginning a function, that I'm writing my own function is with this def, right? So def means I'm defining a function, right? I pass in a name. So this is what I want to name my function. So I call it random password. And then inside of brackets, these are the attributes that I'm going to pass into the function. Now notice there's a little bit of a difference between the two. So this one's called character set. It doesn't have an equals after it. This one's called length, but it does have an equal sign. And this means that if I don't actually pass in a length, it's automatically going to assume that my length is 16. So this is like a default value, right? Now there are some things that go along with the order that things are in, uh, the defaults tend to be, you know, uh, are at the end, you know, things like that. Let's keep it simple for today. And we'll just say that I'm going to pass in two variables or two attributes into my function. Uh, and I'm going to take those values. If I don't specify this last one, it's going to assume a default value for it. Now, this section here is what we call a doc string. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But this is a way for me to document what my function does. And it makes it nice because it automatically pulls that documentation into the REPL where I can kind of query it. All right, so let me erase that. And so now I have my function body. So notice here, same kind of stuff we saw with the if and the for. I end with this double colon or this colon and then I indent. 
And this indent means that, again, everything that follows it is a part of this function. So all of this is the function body. At, you know, I guess I indicated it right there. All right. And so all of this will run when I call this function. So what does it look like when I call it? All right. So down here, I have this random underscore password. Notice it's the same thing here. This is me calling the function. And now I'm passing something into it. I'm passing some type of character set and I'm passing the number 32. So these, this character set doesn't need to be called the same thing. I just happen to have had the variable names called whatever. Uh, I could have called this, you know, my character set down here. And then it just, again, renames it up here inside of this function. Okay, so the character set gets passed in. This number gets passed in for length. And then I use those things. So character set, it looks at the length of the character set. Well, if you didn't pass me any characters, I'm just going to return to you an empty string, right? There's nothing for me to work on, so I pass an empty string. Otherwise, I'm going to create this variable called password. It's an empty list. And then I have a for loop. Now, there's something weird here that we see, and this is an underscore. This in Python is uh, a programmer's way of saying, I know something is going to be passed to me, but I don't care what it is. I just, I'm going to loop across these things, dropping their values each time. And the reason that uh, I'm doing it here is there's this function called range, and it's going to generate a range of numbers up to, but not including, this length. So here I passed in 32. So this is going to be 32 right here. And so range is going to pass in zero, then one, then two, then three, all the way up to 31. Once it gets to 32, it, it jumps out of this for loop, right? And so all I'm using this range for is just to loop then 32 times, right? And so in my password, this list, I'm going to append to it, meaning I'm going to add to the end some character from the character set. There's this function or there's this thing called choice that I imported. Again, this isn't the part that you should really be focused on. It's just the setting up of a function, but I kind of wanted to walk through it so that you kind of see what's going on. But essentially choice takes an iterable like my string. Uh, and it's just going to randomly choose a letter within that string, right? And so randomly I'm choosing one letter and I append it uh, to the end of my list. And then once I've gone through here 32 times, I then join all of those letters together and return it. And so what gets returned gets then assigned to my password and I print my password, right? And let me look to see if I kept a copy of this program. Because again, we didn't go over this. Let me, let me slide up. Oh, come on. Oh, I think I broke it. Of course you would. Man, my terminal doesn't want to come up. It has decided to do what it wants to do. Oh, because I didn't turn my drawing thing off. And that's what's been causing this whole issue. Haha, <laughs> there we go. Let me see. I did keep my password file. Okay, so... So notice it's the same program as before. I have this random password function, right? So def random password. I'm going to call that random password down here. I'm going to give it a character set, which I'm building here. And I'm going to say I want to loop 32 times. It will do that, join them together, comes down to my password, and I'm going to print it. And so what I get 
is a randomly generated password each time, All right? And if I wanted to, I could make it a different number. I could make it six characters long. Now when I execute it, I get six characters. Okay. So nothing too crazy. Obviously, this code is a little bit more complicated and uses some other uh, imports, some other uh, functions that we haven't seen before. But the preface is, or the, the point of this is, is that we use def to define a function. I give that function a name. That function may take uh, attributes, it doesn't have to, depends on what I'm trying to accomplish with my function. I do some things inside my function and then I return some value from it. Now, not all functions will have a return. Maybe it just updates something in one of, of these uh, attributes that I give it. But in my case, it does return a value. So when I call this, that value is returned. It's then assigned to the variable my password. And now I print it out, right? So not too crazy complicated, but if you've never seen it before, it might look a little bit odd. So let's go back to our slides, okay? So I have my function definition at the top. I have some attributes. The body of my function is defined because I used uh, the semicolon or the colon here, and then I indented all of the lines underneath of it. And then I call it down here, okay? So the doc string, as I mentioned before, is a way uh, to indicate uh, to somebody maybe looking at your code, what does this function actually do? And so you can put whatever you want in here. I tend to like to put my function name, the, t the value types that are coming in. So in my case, this was a string, so I put string here. Uh, this was an integer, so I put int. And I'm going to return a string, right? So this is an easy way for somebody to look and kind of get a feel for, okay, I have to pass in a string and an integer, and I'll get a string back. And then maybe I'll write in, what does this function actually do? And then notice here, I have this help documentation. It's automatically built for me based on the doc string that I put in. So since I still have that uh, program around, let me slide back up, bring up my terminal. So I still have this password.py and I can call this with Python 3. And Python 3 takes a switch for dash i um, which says, make this interactive. And I'm doing that because it's going to not only run this program, but it's then going to leave me at a prompt. And so when I hit, just type in dir, I can see that my function, because it was defined, is there. And so I can do a help on random password. And here is my doc string. Right? So it automatically put this as a part of the help documentation. So if any, if I were to give this program to somebody and they were to run it, or they were to import my function into their program, they could look it up and see what does it do. It Well, it had the random password has this thing called random password. It expects a string and an integer, and it will pass a string as its return. So putting doc strings in is just helpful uh, for you when you go back to look at code you've already written, but also when you share your code with someone else, they, they get a feel for, you know, what does it do? How do I run it? Stuff like that. So again, you could put whatever you want in this doc string and that just becomes a part of this help documentation. Okay. Now I think we're coming towards the end. I think we have our final challenges. So we had calling a function and we have writing a function. Okay. So if I delete this and we go here, we will go to calling our function and here we go. So let's see, 
What am I supposed to do here? Well, build a dictionary of purchases. This looks like I made a mistake. This looks to me like I copied the wrong file out. So calling functions, this is definitely not the right thing. All right, let's see if my answers one is the right thing. Or did I really screw this up? Okay, here it is. And it's already filled out because I have obviously messed something up. But uh, I think what you were supposed to do is call roll dice for uh, three dice with six sides. So I had this function that was already predefined called roll dice. It takes in two numbers, the number of dice and the number of sides. So I'm passing in three and six. It's now my rolls. I want you to print rolls. And then uh, I wanted you to print the total of each of the rolls. So we just used sum across the rolls. And so when we hit run, ripple died. Oh because this is called main answer. So let's rename this. It's now called main. When we run it, I get six, five, and four. So let's see. I rolled three dice, so I got three back with six sides. So it should have been one through six are the possible numbers. It looks like everything was done correctly. And then, it, we summed it, so 6 plus 5 is 11, plus 4 is 15. So it looks like it's working, right? And so each time we run it, we should get a different uh, different set of numbers you know, going through. Okay, so I apologize for messing that up, but essentially the big part was being able to call the function, putting in the proper parameters or attributes uh, to that function and then summing it up at the end. Okay, so the other one, I think was writing your own function. So let's see if I screwed that one up too. Oops. So we'll take main. All right, so it doesn't look like this one is screwed up. This one, so I have the function defined up here, but there's no body uh, pass essentially does nothing, right? So if I run this, I have a program that does nothing. Okay, looks like I've got this, oops. All right. I think I've got, I think it was just word wrapping because it was too long. Okay, let's make sure I didn't break anything. Okay, I didn't break anything. All right, so get input from the user. User input equals, and right now it's an empty string. So this would have taken a little bit of Googling, but essentially what you want is the function called input. And inside of brackets, I'm gonna put in some type of prompt. And so I will say, what is the whole point of this function? Write a function called isVal that returns true for val letters, okay? So let's say I am, well, we'll just put my name. Just put it all together for now. Okay, so my name now gets passed in to user input. User input looks like we're using it in a for loop, so I'm gonna go letter by letter in here. And then if, and we're gonna call our function isVal, we're gonna pass in that letter. And if this is true, we're gonna print this. Otherwise, we're gonna print this. So it looks like our function isVal has to return true or false. All right, and we can kind of see that here, isVal in the doc string, it says, char so a character and it's going to return a bool so either true or false so determine if a letter is a vowel a e i o or u 
but we could cheat a little bit and we'll say vowels equals and we could do a tuple that's fine let me just copy and paste that all right a e i o u if well we could do a return of letter in vowels okay so first it's going to take this letter in that you give it and then it's going to do a check to see if it's in that if it's in there this will return true if it's not in there that will return false so this is kind of the same as something like this if well let's not do brackets letter in vowels return true else turn false right so that's the same kind of thing as that right so this is just a short way of saying because this is an evaluation this is gonna look at true or false so i don't really need to return true or false because i'm already returning it right there okay run and i have broken something so i have an error somewhere and it's looking for my error because this is taking a while or letter in user oh i got it ha <laughs> ha here I am waiting for it. Let me stop. It was prompting me. This is the prompt. Give me some input. So it was waiting for me to type something. Some input. And so when I print it, I hit enter. The S goes in because this for loop. S is not a vowel. O is a vowel. M is not a vowel, E is a vowel, I is a vowel, so on and so forth, right? So this input function, this is what happens when you talk and type at the same time. This is a prompt. And so this prompts me for something. And so it was waiting for me to type something. I hit enter. And so some input got assigned to user input. User input went into this for loop. And so we went character by character and character by character we passed to is val is val evaluated whether or not that letter was in this tuple of vowels and it returned true or false so if this evaluated as true we printed is a val if it evaluated as false we printed is not a vowel oops all right so although we had some difficulties because my brain is not functioning at this point um once we figured out you know it was waiting for input it went ahead and looped across all of those things indicating whether or not they were a vowel now notice here that i used all lowercase and I only evaluated lowercase. What would happen then if I ran this and I put A? So we know A is a vowel. It will say A is not a vowel. And that's because what it's looking for is lowercase a. So what would probably be better is to do something letter dot lower. And now when I run it, and I give it a capital A, it will convert that capital A to a lowercase a, and will say A is a vowel, okay? Now, the way I would know that, uh, again, I can do a dir on a string, because I or a char, maybe it's C-H-R, there we go. Um, and although char doesn't have it, when, it's passed in up here. It's 
passed in as that, which Python will interpret that as a string. So if I do a dir on stir, I do have a method called lower, just like I have a method called upper, which is right on the edge there. So upper, right? So that would convert it to uppercase. But in our case, all of these were lowercase. So I convert this one to lowercase during my check, all right? So again, might take some, you know, a little bit of Googling, a little bit of experimentation, uh, but still technically not anything too difficult. We just have to understand what's going on. We have a function, we need to call it, it needs to return true or false. And based on that true or false answer, um, we print is a vowel or is not a vowel. Okay? And I think that was it for the meetup. And I'm sure this video has gone way too long, which it has. So I apologize for that. Um, nobody's probably watching at this point, but hey, uh, it'll be out there in the ethers for somebody to pick up. Okay, so that was the last challenge. That's the last slide. Uh, I want to thank you guys for watching. Uh, I want to thank you guys again to those who were able to make it to the meetup. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, you learn something along the way. You feel a little bit more confident about some of the pieces in Python. And uh, again, we don't cover every aspect of the language, but we'll cover the core parts of it. And you can fill in some of those little pieces like the what does input do? Um, some of these other methods that we kind of looked at. A little bit of Googling uh, will help you out. And as you get more comfortable, it'll be easier to do those things. Um, but I invite you to ask as many questions as you have during the meetup. Uh, if you have questions outside of the meetup, just post it to um, the Discord channel. Uh, I believe you should still be able to at me um, so that um, I'll, I'll get a notification that you've posted something. And then I'll you know, do my best to try to answer it. So this is me signing off. And again, thank you guys uh, for everything. And uh, hope you have a wonderful week.